Digital Dissection, a nerd podcast, can at times contain adult language and themes. It is not intended for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to the Digital Dissection podcast, where we take a closer and possibly unnecessary look at our favorite properties, creators, and topics. We are your humble hosts, Joe and Mark, two pop culture nerds dedicated to telling entertainment history before it's forgotten too soon. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and our blog for more information on the show. We also love to hear from you, so why not write us at digitaldissectionpodcast at gmail.com. And now that we've got that out of the way, let's get to dissecting. Now, Joe, be honest. Mm -hmm. Were you aware that war, war never changes? I, I feel like it does, though. Like it used to be, like you know, like it, it, it never changes. Oh, okay. Yes, just let it wash over you for a minute. Oh, oh, okay. I will. I do. Yes, it's always the same. (laughs) Never changes. Um, (laughs) Because that is the claim (laughs) that Fallout makes. War never changes. It's it's a bit broad sweeping, but I think I know what it means. And that it's 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 kind of like I feel like the uh, it's more of like similar commentary that like Gundam likes to make over the fact that basically as long as as long as people are around we are probably going to always fight each other in some capacity and that war is always going to be an existing reality. Uh, Even though it may, may look different and a few things may change. It's always just going to be there. And it's true. I mean, I just saw you last Mm -hmm. week and we're fighting the entire time. The whole thing. Yeah. We weren't even really eating. Like we're actually, we were fighting through eating. I think we were, it was, it was, it was like almost like a, like a weird thing where like we'd eat and then digest and then shout and then we'd have to wait until we'd eat again to shout the next thing we wanted to. It was very, it was, very weird and almost ceremonial. Yeah, it was difficult to kind of be part of that. And I'm imagining anyone that watched us was just as confused and yeah. Yeah, just bewildered. Possibly, yeah, they were so wishing they were somewhere else, but it is time for retro review. Mm-hmm. So we are returning to video games and going back at a little bit further than last time right we kind of have found this this sweet spot from about 1994 to 2013 mm-hmm. <laughs> we've been <laughs> we've been returning to that well quite a few times yeah, it's, and, it's almost as yeah. if that was the, the 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 you know bulk of our gaming in our lives was from the mid and early 90s all the way into the uh <laughs> the 2000s we still had that joy you know we still had that twinkle we did and 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 not so much anymore as we as we slip into old age and senility. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, we're talking today about 2008's Fallout 3. Mm. And what we want to do before we dive into this mammoth of a of a hit video game that we like to kind of do here on the retro reviews is go back and do some time travel time. Yes. Mhm. So Joe, the world of 2008 We're going to talk a little bit about the world at this Mm -hmm. point in time. Do you remember any popular events, particularly one that took place in Switzerland? This wasn't the, uh, the biodome thing, was it? Where we just, we put a bunch of people in a biodome and would just see if they could actually make it realistically on their own. The facility kind of looked domish, but we're not talking about that. Okay, so no yeah, Polly and... Shore involved in any of this then? No, okay, no, no, yeah. absolutely not. Um, although, the Large Hadron Collider, oh, yeah. the LHC, the, mm-hmm. the massive series of you know, high-powered and very, very uh, quick moving atoms within them, mm-hmm. smashing them together and seeing what happens next. Yes, that's where we found the God that... Particle, wasn't it? Yeah, that's where mm-hmm. we found the God particles, or or, or the uh, dark matter, and when what happens to them when we smash these things together. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it was the inaugural mm-hmm. uh, unveiling of that, or, or whatever you want to call it, because mm-hmm. I'm pretty sure it was being built for almost like ten years, and this was 
this was the time to shine. Yeah, I know. Like, it actually, like, that's when they, they first fired up CERN and got that going. But they didn't, I mean, you know, like, like good, good science. Like, nothing was published on it until many years later after they had to, like, keep running things over and verify what they found was actually what they were looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, so even though, like, I think, like, while it was, like, found in 2008, like, we were hearing about it until, like, what? 2012 2013 somewhere in there yeah that's when like they really started getting spicy yeah you know mm-hmm. stuff was getting hot down there you know and uh suddenly those long white lab coats just got a little more uncomfortable right around the waist <laughs> <laughs> but hey you know what mm-hmm. same area of the world the european union mm-hmm. cyprus and malta adopted the euro oh, joining yeah. the 13 european mm-hmm. countries so the uh, what are those pesos? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I knew we should have gotten Deutschmarks, but they're, they're so, so hard, hard to find. find. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yes, yes. Oh. The euro is officially adopted all across the Europe. Mm-hmm. What do you want to call it? The European Union, I think. Is that the official? Was that? Yeah, it's the. Was that term the adopted e- at that point in time? It was the yeah. I mean, it was the EU. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Right. The extended Europeans. Mm-hmm. whatever you want to call it, the European Union or extended <laughs> universe of the Europeans. <laughs> Either way, that was happening then. Mm-hmm. But in the world of gaming specifically, though, pretty big F and year. Oh. Yeah, that's right. I'm not using the uh, the explicit rating to its fullest potential no. this evening. No, actually, this evening, we're going to only use letters. So yeah. if you if you're mad about that, maybe you can go S and D right now because we're mm-hmm. not going to swear tonight. Yeah, that's going to fail fairly soon, but we're going to try it for a while. (laughs) So, 2008, very big year for gaming. Mm -hmm. Outside of Fallout 3, we ended up getting Grand Theft Auto 4. There we go. God of War, Chains of Olympus. Yeah, that was like, yeah, when we thought like, oh, okay, the narrative of God of War is definitely done. And they, oh, wait a second, there's more. Suddenly. Just like a Billy Mays commercial, there was more. Oh, Billy Mays gone too soon. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens to you when you're taking cocaine and living fast and hard selling cleaning products. <laughs> so outside of Chains Olympus, though, we end up getting Little Big Planet. Oh, yeah. Classic. Mar- Mario Kart for the Wii. Yep, we are definitely like balls deep into motion gaming at this point in 2008. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very hot right now, the motion gaming. Oh, so hot right now. Yes, Mario Kart. We. Yes, you get to steer, actually steer. <laughs> yes, and two more awesome games. We've got Call of Duty, mm-hmm. and Years of War Two, which Carlos Faro, a guest on this show, starred yes. in. Mm-hmm. Major, major title that kind of changed gaming, transformed gaming. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. definitely. I, that is not like a a loaded comment or a, a false no. statement on that one. No, not absolutely not. Whatsoever. Gears of War 2 seriously changed narrative gaming ever since this point in time. Mm -hmm. So it was a major turning point for a lot of dramatic storytelling within video games. So the cutscene wasn't just used to, you know, basically just grunt and, you know, pew, 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 and get you to the next thing. It's like, no, there was, there was acting. Yeah, acting acting and serious story going on. Yes, but no scripts, no No scripts. scripts. Mm -mm, Not allowed. They ad libbed that whole game. Yes, no scripts on the set. Which you can imagine how crazy that would be if they had actually ad-libbed the whole thing. Oh, it'd be, yeah. be out of this world. Mm-hmm. But had no scripts on the set, yes. So Ian, <laughs> part of his, his secret of acting. Oh, you bet your ass. <laughs> yes, yes. Now, quickly, I want to tell you about something here. Within this, this year of 2008, mm-hmm. the top five video games that sold this year, four of them were actually on the Wii itself. That sounds about right, yeah. So, yeah, quickly read these for you. We got Wii Sports yep. took the number one, mm-hmm. you know, uh, mantle there. Yep. Followed so by Mario sure. Kart Wii. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, followed by Wii Fit and Wii Play. Okay. And then rounding up the top five, we have Grand Theft Auto 4, as we mm-hmm. previously mentioned. So these games weren't just coming out in batches. They were doing really freaking well. Yeah, yeah, they were. Holy crap, they were. Like, I just remember, like, the the insane hype over the Wii and everything and how legitimately hard it was to get a console and like how genius that system was though to like find 
basically some sort of niche to fit into and do it well. And what you mostly did is repurpose and repackage literally a GameCube. It's the same processing power, same everything, except now yeah. it can do motion gaming. Um, hey. And they just put it in a, in a sexier package because apparently no one was ready for the purple lunchbox yet. Mm -mm. No. Absolutely not. They wanted that sleek, slightly turned on its side white box. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, this is the realm of 2008. So for those of you that wanted to kind of feel younger again, feel vibrant and remember how things were. This is kind of where we were in 2008. Yep. And I believe this is also, I think we did decide to leave Brittany alone in 2008 after 2007. Right. We did leave her alone for a while. Yeah, we did. I, I, I remember that we were harvesting pop stars. Like it was a, like a crop. Yeah. And yeah, that was unfortunate, mm -hmm. but kind of staying on that tone for a moment though, things that were unfortunate, Joe, did you know that there was actually more than one fallout three? bizarre so they they've made multiple versions of this game well this is a plot twist that actually relates directly to a guest we had in this program oh yes so our our friend over at obsidian entertainment josh mm -hmm. sawyer now b back in the day uh, this is the pre-2008 world roughly about a year and a half to two years before fallout 3 premiered josh sawyer was actually working on what was supposed to be the next fallout 3 game Oh, uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, for those of you who are dedicated to this program and have listened to that interview, at one point in time, Josh Sawyer worked for a studio called Black Isle Studios. Mm -hmm. Now, Black Isle Studios was obviously knee-deep in RPGs, and we're talking about choice-driven, customizable. I mean, we're talking the truest forms yes, of RPG. The purest, really. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Triple fil like Triple-filtered type of RPGs, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, and then distilled one more time. For yes, safety. yes, absolutely. Yeah, so that's what he was working on, dude. He was developing Fallout 3 before Fallout 3. You know, he was doing it before it was cool. The uh, ultimate hipster. Yeah. I have to imagine his glasses were, were definitely thicker back then, and he wore a scarf. He, he's ditched I'm... this now. He, I think he's exclusively all of his headgear and anything from the neck up is a frog helm, and that's all he wears. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Nothing but the best mm -hmm. from medieval times for Mr. Josh Sawyer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So mm -hmm. we kind of, in our conversation with Josh, we kind of avoid this because it was, it's kind of a tough subject, yeah, it's you a know. Sensitive one, and I'm sure, yeah. Yeah. He, mm -hmm. yeah. You're working on a game, you're getting pretty close to the completion, and then suddenly you lose the rights to the game. Wow. Like, you, yeah. Like, if you that's just devastating for a studio. Like, that just has to, like, really, really fucking hurt. Oh, yeah, dude. It hits him right in the pants. It absolutely does. Now, I did say that this is Fallout 3, mm -hmm. of course. But those of you who have read up on Josh Sawyer and some of the things that he's done in his past, he actually named games that he's developing after former U.S. presidents. That he did. So, mm -hmm. yeah, this game went by Van Buren. Hip to yes. the whole scene right there. <laughs> <laughs> aptly mm -hmm. named of course after the u.s president um and so yeah basically that's what uh, any projects he was working on as a director they would basically just go to the next president use mm -hmm. them as the code name so fallout 3 equals van buren einhorn is finkel finkel is einhorn <laughs> but yes mm -hmm. black l studios loses the rights to bethesda sorry van buren we lost to history yep uh, it was almost complete but don't mm -hmm. worry it does actually exist, so you can find a playable version of the game, even though some of the assets aren't 100% complete, and some of the storylines also weren't completely finished. But for the most part, you can explore this game and exactly what it was trying to do. Mm -hmm. So it was actually in the spirit, though, of Fallout 1 and 2. So if you remember, Joe, from our RPG history series, we've talked about the view of the isometric video game. So it's basically that kind of bird's eye type yeah. of view. Mm -hmm. You know, you move on a grid, you have hit points, turn-based combat. I mean, it was wild. <laughs> just just crazy, wild stuff. <laughs> Gaming wild. gone wild, wild, right? You turn on your, your, your TV at 3 a.m. back in 2008, you're going to see games gone wild. Mm -hmm. Very pixelated. And believe it or not, <laughs> they didn't have to do that after the fact anything was made. It's just naturally how it was. Yeah, I can't check after this. <laughs> this isn't this isn't sexy. 
It's just, <laughs> it's nothing but squares. Lots of small squares. Although it still may have awakened something in you. But yes, so let's talk about settings for a moment here, okay? Because we talked about Van Buren, mm -hmm. and now we're get, making our way over to Bethesda, purchasing the rights and now owning the Fallout franchise and what they're looking to do with it, right? Mm -hmm. So, Joe, what do you think the biggest difference would be between a traditional isometric RPG and the new Fallout 3? Uh, I have to imagine... Um probably changing up the uh the viewpoint instead of going bird's eye view you're probably gonna be like uh it's going for the more of the first person shooter which is becoming more of the the attractive look for video games at this time and <sighs> bigger world and i'd have to say those are probably the two big things there's a much bigger more open world to explore and first person shooter pew pew some may say that was an easy question, Nick, and it mostly was. Joe's mm -hmm. played the game. He knows the differences. <laughs> so, so pass with flying colors. But yes, totally. We shifted from mm -hmm. the traditional RPG, told on a grid, where you have X amount of points that you can do, and then you have to basically wait until somebody hits you, and then you mm -hmm. continue, right? Well, yes, the Fallout series by Bethesda is now heavily influenced by what they've done with the Elder Scrolls series, right? So now you have the ability to be a third-person or first person, you know, player viewpoint. And as you can imagine, Joe, what do you think the traditional RPG people out there were thinking about this decision? I have to imagine they were they were probably very, very much the purist and, and enraged and saying, well we're gonna we're gonna boycott this and we're gonna demand that we release the the Black Isle Studios cut and we won't be happy until we get it. And then we're going to demand that Henry Cavill is Superman still, and we won't buy the game because we're, we're still mad at it. You know, I mean, you're, you're not far off, unfortunately. Yep. There was, a, mm -hmm. there was essentially a metaphorical butt crack that split Fallout fans in half, which um, is a lot more graphic than I intended. Yeah, what, one might say it's somewhere between a sphincter and a schism. <sighs> Yes, folks, yeah. and the main lesson in that is to keep your butt clean. <laughs> Never know who's watching. <laughs> okay, I'm not going there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it, it was the beginning of this this kind of split. Yeah, mm -hmm. there were people that were actually kind of hurt and legitimately upset that this is what the Fallout series ended up doing. You know, because between you know Fallout one and two, and then to three, there's about a ten year gap, right, yeah. in development history. So there's no main Fallout game to play during that time. And by the moment we do end up getting Fallout 3, it's a completely different game. It's, it's nothing like mm -hmm. it. Yeah, totally. It's a facelift in the realm of like uh, Grand Theft Auto, right? Yeah. Same type of idea. You're going from like an overhead view to this first person view, mm -hmm. third person view. And it just, it's for some people, they loved it right away. Other people, not so much. Yeah, yeah. It's like we, we like our video games the way they were made when we were young, and we want to keep playing them that way. Dang it. Dang it. Yeah. And, I mean, to a degree, like, we all have that. We get comfortable with our, our hobbies and our things. We, we tend to like them a certain way when it changes. You yeah. know, not all of us like change. Yeah. Hey, not all of us like change, but guess what? A majority of people did in this case, mm -hmm. because Fallout 3 actually ended up having about a 57% higher sales uh, number than even Elder Scrolls Oblivion did in 2006. And almost by the end of the year, right around the holiday season, it had already shipped about 4.7 million units. Which, so, I mean, like your sales going up 57%. You may think, well, 57% is failing a test, but when its sales are up by 57%, that's a huge, huge number and definitely a success. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. And in, in the spirit of not cursing tonight, it was a big farkin deal. Yeah. You're forking right. It was. <laughs> yeah, dude. So yeah, it was, it was a major hit, man. Like when it first came out, mm -hmm. I mean, it was winning awards at E3 the year before, right? What's E3? Uh, we don't talk about E3, <laughs> <laughs> but but seriously, mm -hmm. nowadays, yeah, right? Dude gives a, gives a flying F. <laughs> but, but back then, man, the, the people went nuts over the demo for this. Mm -hmm. It ended up winning all kinds of Game of the Year awards. So 
clearly, yeah, it was a yeah, somewhat they, polarizing game, but mm -hmm. it, but it every, did something right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I guess there was something to it in the way that it moved. So, <laughs> either way, getting into the actual meat of the game for a moment, I think we're done with the history, and the people who are listening this far are probably going, "I want nothing more of this." Yeah, mm -hmm. let's let's but, get to the let's get to the bone of the meat. What's with bite these, into this. these nerds and the numbers and the and the history books? So just give us the fun, dang it. <laughs> Actually, you know what? The idea of like a Northeastern mook listening to us versus like an actual nerd listening to us, mm -hmm. probably a little bit lower now that I think about it. So maybe yeah. they do like these things. <laughs> <laughs> but hey, guess what? Fallout is mm -hmm. finally transformed. Okay. We've got this brand new engine mm -hmm. and it doesn't just transform with graphics or the approach and, and the way that the game plays itself. We're actually taking Fallout from what has historically been a mm -hmm. West Coast game like set in California mm -hmm. and a lot of that, you know, West coast slash mountain time zone, yeah. right? It's been West for almost the entirety. And folks who are listening to this are going like, Oh, what about, you know, brotherhood of steel and all those other fallout games. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about those. No. Mm -mm. Yeah. Just the numbered games. Okay. Yeah. So, so back off, mm -hmm. step off. Yeah. You just shut the front door on that nonsense right now. Yeah, that's a, not here. That's anything. enough. That's no. enough out of you. All you need to know is we went from California love to Big Papa. That's what we've done. We've jumped coasts from west to east when going yes. with Fallout uh, 2 to 3. Yeah, dude, Mr. Vault Boy goes to Washington, mm -hmm. literally. So we're ending up in Washington, D.C., or I should say the ruins of what D.C. once was. <laughs> and <laughs> And some of the outlying areas of of uh of, of dc like so some of the dlc actually takes you to like maryland at one point you get mm -hmm. to explore like these like oceanside towns and everything so definitely an east coast game but it's iconic man like you get to see you know obviously if people had probably been to dc before but to be able to see that in a game and like go to real locations as as you know stylized as it is for yeah. fallout so i mean I, i've been there loved going to dc uh saw a few good museums and sweet monuments and all that and so now if you haven't played this game but you have been to dc just picture all of your favorite things but really broken and yeah. that's the scene that we get right now that's the scene where you get in fallout 3 oh it's it's broken but at the same mm -hmm. time now i'm gonna go a little bit easier on this because a lot of folks think that fallout 3 was painted with every shade of gray possible mm -hmm. Um, which there are parts of this game that do kind of look blended together and, you know, frankly, just a product of the time and the engine available to it. Mm -hmm. But it's still a pretty, pretty fun game. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, and, I would, I would say the, the, the look fits the aesthetic that they're going for. So it's not, I mean, this is not a happy time to be in uh, <laughs> post post war, but at the same time, it's not, a horrible looking game it doesn't look i mean it doesn't look lazy or restricted because like yeah. i think of things like again like superman returns it was a good it's a game that meant well but was clearly like hey this is a movie tie-in we're throwing this shit dang it this shiitake together haha -ha, i saved it <laughs> um uh, and it, it shows it. It really does. When you look, when you fly up above Metropolis and you basically got nothing but these big brown colored, uh, <laughs> rectangular prisms, like, oh, this is what I'm trying to save. And yeah, it's a bad geometry class, but like this, yeah, things do look, you know, run down. They look bad. They look bad. They look bad as in like bleak and dreary, but you know, that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> so yeah. it, it fits that aesthetic and it looks well, like playing the game. Like obviously it's 2008. Um, you're not going to have things load perfectly or render all that quickly on you, but you know when it's there, it brings it pretty well. What I like about this is there's kind of a, an excuse built within an excuse here mm -hmm. because the player character is known as the vault dweller in yes. fallout three mm -hmm. so he spent his life or his or her actually you can choose who, who you how you want your your character to be but you spend the majority of your life underground and <laughs> you're told that nobody leaves the vault no this no. is where you will spend the entirety of your life but plot twist roughly about 20 minutes in that's a lie mm -hmm. yeah. more you got the test results and he determined you were going outside of the vault yes 
Yes, you do yeah. go outside the vault, and uh, thankfully, this is not like a uh, M Night Shyamalan's uh, The Village, <laughs> where it turns out that it's very normal outside of the vault, and you've been lied oh. to your whole life. It's very no. exactly how you were told things were going to be outside the vault, but you yes. just get to leave. Well, and, and the point I was going to make about this, though, Joe, is that excuse that's built within an excuse is that once you leave the vault, mm -hmm. you are actually seeing the world for the first time, oh, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And the effect is so specific because once you leave the brightness of what the sun is poking through, that irradiated sky, it's actually blinding to you yes. as a character mm -hmm. when you first get out. So it was really kind of cool that, as you mentioned, a brand new character interacting with what's a bleak world. Yeah. Well, you don't even know what bleak really is yet. Mm -mm. And so no, I will you, give them credit for that. Yeah. I mean, especially when you walk out and you're just blinded by the light. And the next thing you know, you're just revved up like a deuce and you've become yet one more loner in the night. Uh, <laughs> you're just taken aback by all of that that you can't see the world for exactly what it is just yet. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, but you do quickly realize oh, it's a very, very, <laughs> very harsh world. <laughs> Now, one thing, though, about this game, to kind of get into the, the nuts and bolts for a moment. Now, Fallout was already regarded as one of the best RPGs of all time. You know, player choices influenced how the game kind of worked out. And it really did feel like choice was the driving force behind the RPG. Very similar to how Josh Sawyer told us when we interviewed him mm -hmm. that a great RPG is choice-driven and there's a material struggle, right? Yeah. Now, entering into the world of, of Fallout 3, mm -hmm. that doesn't quite feel like the vibe that I think the original folks were going for. No. Because, I, I mean, to my knowledge, we played the vault very, very differently from each other. <laughs> well, we, we played it differently mm -hmm. from each other, but that wasn't necessarily because of the the specific choices put before you. It's true. Now, with with regards to Fallout 3, and this is one of the few knocks that will actually take against the game, but we're going to do it early, is that this game, when it comes to a design standpoint, okay, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes games will kind of force you along a linear path, yep. even when they do have an open world like this. Others might suggest a way for you to kind of go, and it still feels natural enough to where you know, there's not a gun to the back of your head to go do a like a specific thing. Mm -hmm. Within Fallout 3, some folks might agree with this and some may not. There are large portions of this game that you can completely avoid. And it won't have an influence at all on the plot. Things just kind of keep going as they do. Mm -hmm. And I, I would agree as I'm one of those people I got to skip out on, I think probably a good 25 percent of the game from what i played from where i where i was to where i should have been had i done things as intended it's true mm -hmm. it's it's one of the first things that i remember playing this game was that all of the conventional knowledge and like the stuff that people were telling me to do in game was to go to this point and do this for some reason i decided maybe out of stubbornness to just go the other way <laughs> Yep, you went your own way. That's One yep. Day. You got to go your own way. Just what it is. You don't, mm -hmm. you don't want me there, so I'm going. You know, like <laughs> so, I, dude. Mm -hmm. Seriously, it's for some people skipping that much of the game and kind of vaulting ahead. No pun intended. Mm -hmm. I might mean, actually be okay. I think you should intend the pun at all times. It's a sign, <laughs> sign of strength and aggression. Like, yeah. Maybe not aggression, but a sign of strength. It's aggressive to strength. To intend the pun. Yeah. <laughs> it's true, though. There are parts of this game, just like a lot of RPGs, that can go undiscovered. But if you're not careful with Fallout 3, there is a chance that you can skip, like you mentioned, almost a third of the game. Mm -hmm. And that's incredible to think. Like somebody put that much time and effort into kind of driving you towards something, and you can just completely skip it. Yep, not doing that. Mm -mm. Yeah, so that's just something for folks that haven't played this game to kind of think about. Something to consider. Like yeah. you've played a lot of games that mm -hmm. tell you to go to A to B to C. It's possible for you to go like A to G without even realizing it. It's true. <laughs> and if you would like to realize how to do that, there are definitely videos on YouTube that will show you how to go from A to G and skip everything in between. Yeah. Which honestly is, I think, 
once again, this is another early knock we'll give to Fallout 3, is that Fallout has an extremely rich mythology that's built within to it, or within yeah. to it, within it, within to it, within good it? Lord, combining words. Yep. In, <laughs> within it, ridiculous mytho or mythology, lore, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. And that's a shame, honestly, if you skip these massive parts, because every terminal, unless they're broken, every computer terminal, every note, everything that you can pick up, there's so much there that Bethesda doesn't really do enough here to kind of point you towards those things, mm -hmm. which obviously the Fallout worlds are meant to be explored, but we've changed that, that, that nature, right? So Fallout 3 does kind of suffer from that a little bit because we get a bit too much of the pew, 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 and not enough of the the narrative driven emotional you know story mm -hmm. uh, that 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 sometimes fallout is pretty much going to have yeah and i think to a degree that still is there there's a good narrative that's in this that's a part of this game which sure yeah. i mean and again like i guess i don't know because like i i played through the game and i, mean, I, I didn't even get all the way through it I, I liked what i played but there is a good story being developed uh within this within the game and I don't feel like I necessarily missed out on any major part of that story by skipping a chunk of the game. True. Mm -hmm. The only thing I'm going to tell you, though, is that there are certain elements of exploring the game that will give you more insight into the player character's dad. Uh -huh. And so plot twist here, mm -hmm. or for folks that have somehow managed to avoid this game for the better part of mm -hmm. 14 years... Yep. <laughs> you, and yeah. by the way, your dad is voiced and played by the incomparable Liam Neeson. Oh, he, he absolutely is. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's it's a great performance. And frankly, that's where I think a wasted opportunity is kind of here is that you don't get to interact with him a ton. No. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, I think that's where a lot of the fun in the story does live is understanding how your dad got you into the vault because you didn't actually live there. Mm hmm. Right, he he actually leveraged his way into the vault because when Vault One Hundred One, when you are basically put into it as the the post apocalyptic world exists in Fallout Three, a massive amount of of nuclear weapons are fired upon all of the major countries of the world, and the vaults were designed by people to live in so that you could obviously avoid the massive bombs that are being dropped, but also to withstand and survive past that point right yes mm -hmm. so vault 101's doors were supposed to stay closed and never open again like that was the mission of the vault mm -hmm. so that's where i think a lot of the intrigue should have come from but instead a lot of this story narrative is centered upon finding your dad yep and not so much how did you get into the vault yeah no. you f you'll find out little things mm -hmm. as you go right because Keep in mind, Joe, I've played this game for easily over 600 hours. <laughs> Not even ashamed to say mm -hmm. it. I found a lot of stuff by multiple viewings and, and several helpings here. <laughs> but, <laughs> but this is more to paint a picture for people to understand that this game is not a traditional RPG. Mm -hmm. It just isn't. No. Right? I mean, there's plenty of cool things you can do in it that kind of resemble RPGs, like you know, looting things. Yep, you gain uh, XP as you go along. You can yeah. level up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. And one of the things that is a major difference between the original Fallout games and this one is what's referred to as the random encounter. And no, we are not talking about Craigslist. No, <laughs> no. At least, at least not yet. We'll see where the evening takes us. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but in the original Fallout games, Joe, when you would travel from place to place, you had the opportunity to do this through like a world map, right? Yes. So you would, mm -hmm. you would pick a location and then you would travel to it and through the map, you would encounter these random things. Sometimes they would be just straight up combat, right? Yep. Other times it would be a refrigerator that's just sitting out in the middle of the desert. Mm -hmm. Indiana Jones falls out of it and then he just walks out on his way. <laughs> Yeah, which mm -hmm. would get referenced in a later Fallout game, by the way. Uh, <laughs> but but the random encounter, when you kind of take away that turn-based 
environment and, and the way that the old Fallout games were kind of built out, Bethesda had to figure out a way to insert the random encounter into this first person slash third person Fallout experience. Mm -hmm. So you've played a little bit about this, Joe. I can tell you a lot more about what happens, but here's the thing. The random encounter system in Fallout 3 does rely on fast travel to an extent, but it's much more based on specific, we'll just call them like progress points, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, for example, Megaton is one of the cities in the game that you discover very early on. If you go behind Megaton and walk like a few meters, you'll trigger a random you know, encounter event. And that was one of the strengths of this game that I think did translate well from the old you know version of fallout because it still kept the wasteland you know unpredictable yeah right mm -hmm. as it should be <laughs> yeah exactly now some people said that they encountered the same random encounters quite a bit which kind of took away from what should feel like a random number generator experience mm -hmm. the way i see it if you play a game for that long because I don't think most people are picking this up and playing it for like five hours and then being done with it. Mm -mm. Some of these encounters are going to become familiar to you. And I mentioned the refrigerator, right? Like the refrigerator does actually show up again in Fallout 3. <laughs> <laughs> and, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and people are fighting over it, right? Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of the complaints that came from how encounters work within this universe had little to do with what actually occurs in the game and once again, shifting to this purism route mm -hmm. and, and being upset with it changing. Um, but yeah, I, if I had to pick a gripe on behalf of people that wanted to judge this game, okay, it would most likely be one of your favorite things to do in it, which is using the vault assisted targeting system, otherwise known as VATS. Mm -hmm. Joe, yeah. can you explain to the folks tonight what VATS is? I love VATS. Uh, VATS is basically, so think of it this way. One of the basically key arguments against like first-person shooters uh, on consoles versus PCs is in PCs, you can really put your mouse overhead, click, and boom, headshot. A lot of control there. Really great. A lot better. Whereas like you know, if you're using your sticks, it's like, yeah, and things are running at you. It's hard to aim. And it is much more difficult to pull off. So what you can do with VATS is by a nice quick hit of the R2 button. It actually goes down to a freeze frame. And you can choose what part of your body, of the body of the, of the target you want to actually shoot at. It gives you a percentage of the likelihood of hitting that spot based off of like how far away you are from them, what weapon you're trying to use, um, and you know, the damage it could do to it. Obviously, I actually think, I don't think it gives you damage, but like obvious things, like if you shoot in the head, it's going to do more than shooting something in the arm. So, but you have a much better chance of hitting the chest than you do any other thing. But, yep. you know, it, it's nice because it slows it down. So you can literally like dogs jumping at you, hit the vats, slows it down where the dog is just frozen. You can select the head, hit R1, and then boom, you hit, you hit X, however many like shots you want to take at it and vats does have like a recharge meter so you can't just like use it super willy-nilly because it does run out on you so if you use like i think it's like good for like four shots for the most part so if you use all four of yeah. your shots um on one thing then something else jumps at you you can still freeze frame it but like it won't let you actually shoot so you've got to go back to the traditional actually trying to shoot it with just the sticks which as a feature, I think it's great. Mm -hmm. um, for me, the first time I played it, actually, like when I played this, when I played Fallout Three, not one and two, because I understood what how to play a turn-based game. But when it came to Fallout Three, for some reason, I didn't actually use Vats in the tutorial, and so I was manually shooting at stuff for a very long time. Now, after figuring out how to use Vats, I understand about the criticisms of essentially having a permanent crutch in your gameplay experience because once again, we've removed a lot of RPG elements mm -hmm. out of Fallout that critically like made it what it was. 
And so VATS was kind of an extension of that. People went like, this is making the game so easy that it completely nullifies a lot of these other things that they tried to do. Now, we haven't even talked about the skill system or the perks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and perks have been a mainstay of the Fallout experience since the beginning where you can pick out things that either kind of augment your character uh, with like unique abilities or to help you know like rise up on certain skills and you know kind of vault you ahead there once again no pun intended uh, no I, sir do not hold back on the puns you just let them fly <laughs> well either way the the dna of the fallout games on its face appears like it still lives there when you look at the skill system mm -hmm. right there are things like lock pick and uh, you know, gun efficiency and explosives and speech, all the things that are known to be in these games. But truly, in a Fallout game, it was weird that you could literally solve the majority of your problems by either having a strong lockpick or being able to shoot the hell out of things really well. Well, I mean, <laughs> and, I think those are just the two skills you really just need. Everything else is, I mean, a post-apocalyptic wasteland, what are the two things you want to be able to do? break into things and shoot things well you can do those and i think that's the real skill set you need you don't need some sort of bizarre like post-apocalypse university on how to you know cook a proper meal because like you're just gonna put whatever you want to over a fire anyway so why not be good at shooting and, and breaking into stuff it's true mm -hmm. but you know like the first time i played it I wasn't actually very judgmental of this stuff. Mm -hmm. Like it was just fun to me to go, oh, okay, well, I'll just put my skill points into science so that I can hack the next terminal. Right. Yeah. Like, like that kind of stuff was uh, fun for me the first time. Mm -hmm. But as you play this game more and you build characters, because something that was fun about the old games was that character builds, like in an RPG sense, actually did things. You know, like if you wanted to do like an unarmed character build that just fought with their fists and 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 some of the augmented, you know, melee weapons, mm -hmm. you could do that and obviously suffer the consequences. But ultimately, you could still play a game by doing character builds like that. In Fallout 3, character builds don't necessarily, I would say, matter at all. You know, doing a character build where you uh, put a whole bunch of your your skill points into you know let's just say unarmed for example mm -hmm. it's actually numerically possible to get every single one of your stats to 100. Ooh. You, you can max you out max every everything. single okay every single skill so it doesn't really matter in the in the the grand scheme of things uh so when like for those of you listening or watching since we're both an audio and mm -hmm. visual program here Joe and I played this game together, and I've obviously had a lot of dash time with it. Joe hadn't, mm -hmm. and so I was trying to gently nudge Joe in directions here that I thought would be the most useful because truly you could bury your skills into, or your number, your, uh, your skill points into like six skills, and they can carry you through the entire game, right? Like speech, yep. lockpick, science, um, you know, th those are the big three right mm -hmm. <laughs> like like once you have those you can open any door you can you know you can go anywhere right so yeah i mean and then it, i mean you yeah. still have your other stuff like you know luck and intelligence and I, yeah i tried bearing as much as i can into luck and just rolling the dice on everything it, it's true mm -hmm. luck actually luck is one of those skills that uh we're not going to go through the entire character build thing here because there's just not enough time but you can you can still build characters for your your main skills and then what joe is referring to is the special system which you have a uh, series of, of of things that you can put additional points into and then they uh, you know impact how much stuff your character can carry you know your chance to get a critical hit all that kind of stuff mm -hmm. but once again joe i will challenge you the longer you play this game <laughs> just mm -hmm. just look at how much it matters <laughs> and and it may feel like mm -hmm. i'm being really hard on fallout 3 right now as much as i actually enjoyed this game <laughs> but these are the these are the realistic things that you have to kind of think about the longer you play it 
Like, do, do my choices actually matter? Do the skills actually matter? And how much should I invest in what? So mm -hmm. it's, it, it may seem harsh, harsher than even the landscape you're playing in, <laughs> but, <laughs> but in my older age, I appreciate a more traditional RPG as opposed to what Bethesda has kind of turned RPGs into mm -hmm. from this time period. They've gotten a lot better since then, but for this time period, the RPG was, was kind of, uh, the elements were basically passenger seat to mm -hmm. the rest of what Bethesda was trying to do here. Yeah. And I mean, that being said though, they still made a fun game. <laughs> like I, I've enjoyed playing despite the fact that like, there's no really weight into the categories I'm putting in, um, for my, for my skill tree, but I don't know. Still had fun. And you know what? I will say this for a fallout game, this might be one of the weaker ones when it comes to what most of the other games try to do well, mm -hmm. which is aligning with factions in the game and making choices that impact those factions, right? Yeah, yeah, there definitely wasn't much of that in this at all. Like, I, there's what a faction in this one, uh, you know? Oh, no, no, I take that back. They were, hmm, I think of maybe two. <laughs> Maybe that's too. <laughs> that, that's the thing, Joe. Mm -hmm. In a traditional Fallout game, most people can answer that question without having to do what you just did. <laughs> <laughs> and so mm -hmm. in Fallout 3, really the only struggle that exists, and you can't even really put a whole lot of backing into who you want to win, mm -hmm. there's the Brotherhood of Steel, mm -hmm. which uh, is one of the original factions that goes back all the way to the beginning. Uh, there's the Enclave, which is the former remnants of the U.S. government. Yes. And then you pretty much just have different towns in in this game. Mm -hmm. And you can impact what happens to a couple of them. But even then, once you do that, not a whole lot really changes other than people that uh, want to come after you when you fast travel. Because mm -hmm. they'll send people after you. You'll That's... Once again, some of the spice of the game. A little bit. You get some weird religious zealots who are very mad. You disarmed their uh, their bomb. They're not thrilled <laughs> with that, and they come after you for it. But I mean, hey. Technically, yeah. it's not the religious zealots that come after you. It's <laughs> mm -hmm. it's people that wanted to blow up the bomb for uh, their own their own reasons. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. So it's, even then, though, the, once again, Joe, the fact that you have played this game for you know roughly about twenty hours. Mm -hmm. You have enough confusion yep. already. It is just just from that. So that's that's a point that I I also want to nail down here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm, all I could think was like, I'm trying to even think if to the point where I got into it, like they actually mentioned the Enclave. Because like with me, the factions are like it's either the Brotherhood of Steel or the people running the vaults, and those are the factions I was thinking. And I don't even remember hearing the Enclave to be honest. <laughs> well, you were getting close to where the Enclave mm -hmm. comes in. Because they do really impact a lot of the second half of the game. Mm -hmm. And the Enclave is the quote-unquote, you know, bad guys, right? Bad guys yes. in the game. Mm -hmm. So really, I think what the important thing to mention here is that this is a, a new age for Fallout, right? Like, this is not a traditional RPG, as we've kind of, I've kind of <laughs> knocked on a couple times. But it is more of what I would consider an arcade style game. Mm -hmm. You know, like there are people that like to make the distinction between how Madden football used to play back in like 2005 versus how it plays now. <laughs> right. <laughs> Where mm -hmm. you have to jiggle a stick just to put on your cleats. You know, this is not that complicated kind of game. And, and that's why I think to your point, Joe, why so many people liked it was because a lot of people, either knew about Fallout or had had at least a, a high opinion of it going in. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that style of play where it's fairly generic, you have that crutch built in with that. Mm -hmm. All of those things kind of coming together with the story that you mentioned with your dad and, and some of the emotional weight of that. Yeah, it does still craft a pretty compelling 
and entertaining game. You know, it's it's a snowball effect because mm -hmm. I had played Fallout 1 and 2 before playing 3, so I had some of the background on what happened on the West Coast. And so when you get out here, you do get to un uncover what is kind of on like either unexplored territory or new mysteries and, and, and new types of uh, new types of revelations. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, it does have um, that intrigue kind of built into it. And so I will give it credit there that once again, I kind of knocked this a little bit for skipping half the story, <laughs> <laughs> but, but on my way, on my way there, I did uncover this like underground uh, raider headquarters where there's just all of these crazed people, right? <laughs> and and I went in there and I cleared it out, mm -hmm. right? And I had a bunch of these stuff. Um, <laughs> I went beyond that and I found a village of cannibals, which was a really, really creepy and compelling side quest, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that it's not to say that there's not some very fun things that are buried in this. There, there, there's there's definitely care put into the side quests and truly the discoverability of the game. I, so I say that the, the map is huge for everything that's there. Like there's enough of that actual like DC proper to explore. And then of course, like the outlying area, which I think I barely even touched on when I played. Um, I, I, and skipping a good chunk of it, just sticking to like progressing the story really fast. Uh, there is definitely plenty to do in this game and, and get out there and explore while you're while you're playing. Very true. Mm -hmm. Very true, man. And I, I do want to come back to the random encounters for a moment mm -hmm. because there are ways that these random encounters can truly adjust uh, just how powerful your character can be. So sometimes these random encounters can be as simple as I've mentioned, people kind of fighting over uh, some type of material or something, right? Mm -hmm. Other times it's a person that, you know, asks you a question but intends to shoot you as soon as you turn around kind of stuff. Yeah. But what was previously an Easter egg in the Fallout games that makes reference to aliens, Fallout 3 really leaned into this. <laughs> much harder <laughs> mm -hmm. um, to the point where uh, a DLC for the game actually it's called Mother Mothership Zeta it actually takes you to a an alien UFO and you, yeah. and you and you basically explore this massive ship okay some people once again thought hard to please everybody too far out there yeah they thought mm -hmm. it was too far out there but as it pertains to a random encounter though there is a possibility to trigger a UFO crash. Ooh. And when that crash occurs, an alien weapon drops from it that you can use. Ooh. Some hot Roswell so, action style things going on now. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So like the game, once again, there's enough mysteries here. There's enough fun things that can kind of navigate you past, you know, some of these problems, mm -hmm. right? Or some of these issues that people have brought up like myself and others. So I think what the real takeaway here, if we want to talk about this game and the legacy of it, because we do that a lot, don't we? We, we always do. kind of talk yeah, about like, what, what's its impact on on society at at, at large was post. Mm -hmm. I, well, I'll tell you what we'll do here. Um, I will wait. I want to know what you think the legacy of the game is based on what you've experienced and really just what you've heard about it so far. Well, I mean... Given that this franchise more or less stuck with the formula that this game brought on, obviously, like we said, they, they tweaked it so that like your decisions matter more, like actually like assigning points to different parts of your skill tree actually affect how you can play the game more. But I mean, those were like logical things that would have to happen. Like there are going to be holes in how a game is made. Um, there are going to be issues uh, to be hammered out as things go on. But they did that. So I think what this game was did for Legacy is it completely changed how like a lot of modern RPGs work uh, for things uh, switching away from turn-based 
and going more towards what we have here, this open world, not a grid, not like the, the traditional even like JRPG run into an encounter and your party is there and there's a bad party, things like that. And even then, like I think like with discuss of like how like Fallout worked and then how like Borderlands worked because of how Fallout worked, um, that you even saw JRPGs change. Uh, to this more fast-paced style of RPG where Final Fantasy doesn't really resemble much of what that used to be because of games like this. So I think it had a pretty big impact on on the genre. And I think that's its biggest legacy, is that it really did change RPGs from this traditional thing that we've had uh, since more or less really the 70s um, un- up until this point. And... There's almost been no looking back because, for the most part, we don't get that old turn-based RPG anymore. It's very true, and I think that could just be maybe a natural progression of what gamers found interesting. Mm-hmm. And I, and I don't I don't want to alienate RPG like traditional fans because there are still companies making traditional RPGs mm-hmm. in this vein, as we talked about. Josh Sawyer's contributing yeah. to to those as well as a lot of other companies still. Mm-hmm. So the avenue is still there. But yes, I agree with you that Fallout 3, specifically Bethesda's efforts with it, ended up creating a more general consumption view mm-hmm. of the Fallout universe, right? Like it, it didn't feel like it was uh, gatekept anymore from folks that just played computer games yep. versus console games. You know, like we, we kind of got that, that middle ground now. And Fallout was a popular series, like we mentioned before. But if you walked up to a person, you know, pre-2008 and said, hey, have you played Fallout? Very high likelihood they didn't. Yeah, big no. Yeah. And I, I definitely was one of them because I, I did not play Fallout 1 or 2. Yeah, and a lot of people mm-hmm. a lot of people didn't and then went back after playing 3, mm-hmm. right? So there is that interesting effect of two completely different styles of games influencing each other because now you've got people that... That played this and maybe found the old stuff you've got people that were purists with the old stuff and decided to stop there mm-hmm. you know so i will say that overall fallout 3 helped make this become easier to consume for people there's a lot of folks that play video games that will never touch rpgs because it's just not their thing yeah fallout 3 made it easier to be a part of that mm-hmm. that or that world make it interesting so given given that I, I will give them credit that it is a fun game. There's a lot of stuff for you to do, a lot of things you can uncover. And I told you, I played this game for 600 hours, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> Not exaggerating. Even on like my 10th playthrough, mm-hmm. I still found things I didn't know about. I believe it. Again, like it's it's just a huge game. There is so many things to do. And again, on top of that, like again, random encounters. Who knows exactly how many things? I mean, there are people who do know because I'm sure they've they've data mined it, they've looked into it. But like the amount of like again, how many random encounters are there, and what exactly can you experience each time you go there, and how long will it take for you to even see something new? You may think it, you may have like, oh, I've seen all the random encounters, and it turned out you maybe just kept rolling the same thing over and over again, and now you get something different when you play through the tenth time. It's very true. And Joe, there is a Seinfeld reference in this game that a lot of the top 10 lists will usually point out. I'm not sure if you're familiar with it, but I guess I'll just ask you bluntly. Do you know what the Seinfeld reference is in this game? I'm going to say there is probably a car ruined somewhere with the plates that say Arse Man on it. (laughs) You know what? I actually wish that would have been it. (laughs) Uh, okay, so you might notice we've been pretty clear about not getting too far into the actual plot of this game because mm-hmm. we still don't want to ruin it. There are people no, still no. finding this, this game later. But the Seinfeld reference in this game, there are characters in these games, this game called Super Mutants that are you know mutated humans that you learn a lot about, okay? Mm-hmm. So we're not, not going to ruin that. No. But there is a very specific Super Mutant that walks the wastes whose name is Uncle Leo. <laughs> and you can encounter him up to, I think, three different times. Oh, my God. And if you if you encounter him and don't say hello, does he get mad about it? 
<laughs> he doesn't. No. Okay. No, just it's because of how the super mutants tend to be. Um, their brains are mush. Like they <laughs> they're not very smart. But it, it's it's it was one of the most funny things I saw uh, in the game when I first played it. And I'm like, mm-hmm. this character is literally named Uncle, Uncle Leo. Leo. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But I, as I say that though. One of my favorite quotes from a video game actually comes from Fallout 3. Mm-hmm. And oddly enough, it comes from one of the few super mutants that can actually speak or can actually give you uh, lucid thoughts, okay? Okay. The only reason why I want to call it out is because we're just about to get to the actual review time. And going into this, I want to slightly give you uh, a hard-hitting quote from this game. Okay. Okay. I know this is influencing the score potentially, but character of Fox, who's a super mutant that you run into later in the game, mm-hmm. uh, aptly named after Guy Fox, for those of you who uh, are familiar with the the old uh, icon of history, V for Vendetta influence, all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Fox says in the game that in all things, a calm heart must prevail. And the first time he said it, I was just kind of exploring the wastes and he's just kind of talking to himself. And I'm like, oh my god, that's mm-hmm. that's like that's like poetry. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, as I'm sitting there covered in like potato chips, and <laughs> you know, my shirt's halfway up, you know. <laughs> but I will say that, like, this game can feel like cookie cutter mm-hmm. to an extent, but there's personality right around the corner. So yeah, take from that what you will. I think just like the real real guy Fox, you know, you got cal- in all things, a calm heart must prevail. So let's blow the fuck out of Parliament to restore power to the Catholic Church. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's commentary <laughs> for another day. But as retro reviews tend to go, it mm-hmm. is time to give out some points. And this episode of retro review, we're going to use for our unit of measurement here, out of a possible five points will be the bottle cap, which is the official currency of yes. the Fallout universe. Mm-hmm. There is old world money that you can collect and use throughout the game, but it's the bottle caps. Yes. That's what the people that's what gets the people going. Yes. So it gets them all it's hot provo- and bothered. It's provocative. <laughs> all right, Joe, for two thousand eight, let's talk some graphics okay. here. Okay. Now, what do you think of the graphics of Fallout three compared to others of the time? We talked about game or we talked about God of War, mm-hmm. talked about Grand Theft Auto, what do you think of the graphics? Uh, graphics wise, this one, and I know like I was, I was, I was fairly nice to the look of this game much earlier in in the episode, saying that you know it is a bleak world and therefore should look bleak and not just ver- like varying shades of gray. Look, like, got blown to hell. What do you think it's going to look like? Um, but that being said, like even comparing to like God of War, like I remember like God of War three, which was before um, Chains of Olympus, and I thought that was a cleaner looking game. <laughs> so yeah. looking at that, like I feel like this is a game. Like I I don't know much about like I, other than what we talked about with the development history about Bethesda getting this, and I don't know if they were like pushed for a deadline because obviously like part of the way that you could actually skip most of the game is that you literally fell into the map and could walk and physically go underneath and through buildings that you're not meant to even, they're just not meant to be accessed or gotten to. Um, So here, I think compared to other things at the time, I'm going to give this like probably a solid like three point, Seven five? Can we do seven five bottle caps? We, we, we've done that historically. I'm going to do three point seven five bottle caps out of five for graphics on this one. You know what? I'm I'm going to go a little bit harsher. Oh, okay. I thought I was being mean by giving it less than a four. Okay. No, no, I'm going to go a little bit harsher on this because I'm a big fan. Don't get me wrong, I'm a big fan of Bethesda games. Mm-hmm. Okay, so I played Elder Scrolls Oblivion. I played Morrowind before that. Um, I played a little bit of Skyrim, which may seem like it's uh, sacrilege, <laughs> because <laughs> you gotta understand. I played once again. I played Morrowind, played yep. Oblivion, played Fallout Three, played Fallout Four, and then I tried to play, yeah, Skyrim, mm-hmm. and it just just, just hasn't worked just out. Just hasn't well. worked out. Okay, didn't take. Just way too much dash time with these games. I'll mm-hmm. put it that way. There's a lot. But, but 
Oblivion also had the same problem, Joe, with some of the environments feeling like it was not enough contrast and Fallout 3's graphics, whether it was just the engine, you know, some of the character faces and stuff, they're just rough. They really are. Yeah. Like you, you the the cold dead eyes of almost every character, <laughs> the <laughs> the smoothed mm-hmm. over tone of a lot of the backgrounds and 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 frankly, some of the character models too, they blend right in with stuff. They really do. And know? I'd have to say the always like rather unenthusiastic faces on every character and the like the same straight emotion. Yeah. Doesn't change from character to character. It really doesn't. Yeah. And and for that reason, I, I wanna go more middle of the road here because the overall experience I think is pretty solid. Okay. Mm-hmm. But as far as graphics go, it, it's it's not the it's not the best graphics game from this generation. I'll put it that way. And for the fact that like Gears of War two came out the same year on a different console, and it managed to show you just how different environments can look against each other, I'm gonna give it a three out of five bottle caps. Ooh, ouch! Yeah, yeah, it's it's, it's not. It's not quite right in the middle. Mm. It's a little bit better than yeah. the middle, mm-hmm. but but yeah, that's that's where I think we're going to go with that. Yeah, but I I think that's fair. <laughs> yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Now now coming back on the snake though, looking at gameplay for this this mm-hmm. series or this game, I should say, I will give this a little bit higher of a score because of the variety of things that can be done in this mm-hmm. game, like we talked about. It's like yeah, okay, if you don't like the skills and the perks and you think they're just too easy whatever that's a very small part of the game yeah right but as we talked about the gameplay with vats or if you just want to use iron sights Mm -hmm. doesn't really matter you can do whichever one you want yeah and it's not to say that they executed everything to perfection Mm -hmm. but they still give you a lot of different things you can try out you know like if you want to play this game with largely explosives or you know if you want to try and figure out your luck with once again the melee weapons the unarmed mm-hmm. stuff it's all there for you to do oh yeah you know so i thought the gameplay was was pretty solid for this game mm-hmm. despite some of the criticisms i've kind of levied <laughs> against it <laughs> um mm-hmm. but for this i will say the gameplay i don't think it's going to just be this way for me i think it's going to be this way for a lot of people and obviously the sales showed it too yeah. right so the gameplay, I think, is a lot stronger, and I will give it a three point seven five. Yeah. So I think it is. Mm-hmm. I think it is there. I think the gameplay is pretty good. Yeah, this is definitely a case with the grosses were not too low, and this this is <laughs> this quite succeeded. Um, and I think three point seven five is good. Um, all I can think of with this is one, how much fun I actually enjoyed with the game. Uh, I am someone who every once in a while, if the game does seem too big, because I do like to be a completionist with games, that if it seems way too big, I'm like, I'm never going to fucking finish this thing. I, I, dang it, I blew it. Oh, can't take that back. I forked one. I forked too hard right there. Dang I think you did it twice, Joe. I just yep. didn't tell you. Yeah, it's okay. Sorry. <laughs> we'll have to put the explicit label on now. But I would say, like, still a fun game um despite the fact that it did seem like this is this is one where i would probably say fork it i'm not gonna finish the game i'm just gonna get through the story and call it and that does like kind of kill a small part of me as a gamer i die a little bit inside each time i say that to a game like i'm not gonna finish it i'm just gonna beat it and call it a day uh so that doesn't keep me happy with that so if you're in that same boat where if a huge game seems like it can overwhelm you that's gonna happen and I also have to think uh, from also the standpoint over, like, obviously, like, I, I just talked about how, like, thanks to a glitch of falling through the map, you can actually skip a good chunk of the game. Um, but I'm just also thinking, like, what if this is like an Assassin's Creed Unity for me? And I find that, and I don't know what's going on. And then what it really did is actually just make me lose progress in what I was doing and make me mad. And how frequently that can happen in this game. So I feel like if you are like picking this up with the intent to play all the way through it and something like that happens and now you've got to actually like, you know, go back to where you were before because this is a game where I don't think it has um, automatic saving, does it? 
It does. Okay. But a lot of that is based on fast traveling. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, and so like you said, there is a possibility for you mm-hmm. to, you know, maybe run for uh, a good 10 minutes in game, mm-hmm. not encounter anything, right? Yep. And then... Die and then have to go back in time and yeah. start back over. So that, that there is that real possibility. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can still manually save. Oh, yeah. It's so an it's, important thing to do. It's the idea of having to go, you know, even for then, like going back, making sure you did manually save. Otherwise, you got to go back quite a bit. Um, oh, yeah. That I would say, I'd probably go like three and a half bottle caps on this one. Um, for gameplay? For gameplay. Uh, still a lot of fun. Re- I enjoyed what I had. Vats actually uh, was a part of this I really enjoyed. Um, oh, okay, as cool. someone like that, that actually like heightened the gameplay for me quite a bit. And the fact that again, if this is like the game is absolutely huge and VATS is something that I think, uh, for someone like me who wants to complete a lot of it, or in some cases, I'm going to just go through it to get the story and see what happens. VATS is awesome for that because it's going to be, it's going to speed things up. You're not worried about necessarily having to, you know, survive a skirmish when you know if you time it right and use the system properly you can come out of most scenarios just fine sure yeah, which is true mm-hmm. it is true it, it does kind of take it from uh maybe making it too hard to be immersed in to you know maybe easing mm-hmm. off on the the harshness of the wasteland just a little bit yeah right yes and maybe I, take anxiety I also away. apologize for the number of time for those of you watching uh this this is podcast i have looked down a number of times sullivan is sitting at my feet and the last time we tried recording, he did unplug my computer twice <laughs> in one one recording. So he's back down there. I just keep making sure that his his butt is nowhere near my power cord to unplug my computer as we get to this pivotal part of the retro review. Of course, which brings us to, of course, the replay value. Now, yeah. Joe, mm-hmm. what what kind of score would you give that out of five bottle caps? See, this is one where. Uh, I think it's almost not fair to have me do this because I, I do like what I've done so far uh, in the story quite a bit. I haven't finished it yet. And really, this should depend mostly on how the game wraps up for me to give a really, really strong review on it. But I don't have that. And I do know that, again, like this is an enormous game and there's a plethora of things to do. But due to the style of gaming that I like to do, that actually hurts the replay value because... Like, I know, like, with you, like, you enjoy the idea that you could go back and do it a completely different way. You have so many other things where you could do, like, four or five, like, you know, playthroughs on this and experience something dramatically different each time you go through. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't thrill me because, like, I need to do everything to make sure it's done. And that way I don't have to pick it up and do it again. And since I don't know where the story ends off, I can't do like my Uncharted Summers were this, where I've got a beautiful game, I know exactly how, how, how big the sandbox is, and I can, I can enjoy it for the story's sake. So for me, given what I have done and what my understanding of what it is past what I've done, I can give this one a 2.5 bottle caps out of 5 on this one because I don't think... I would go back and replay it based off of how I typically play video games. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's mm-hmm. fair. Uh, here's, here's what I'll say about that as a, and this doesn't, you don't have to change your score at so all. So you're going to tell me why I'm wrong right now. And I'd love to hear it. What I'm going to say to you is that the original version of mm-hmm. fallout three before any DLCs had a definitive ending. Ooh. So you would play it up to the, the quote unquote finish mm-hmm. the, the finish, the end of the game. And that was it. You had to live with other choices you made and anything that you did before that point. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're done, right? All right, yeah. But a specific DLC called Broken Steel came out and they ended up changing it so that you could continue playing past the end of the game. Okay. Yeah, so Mm -hmm. you could go back and you could wrap up some of these side quests and maybe stuff you hadn't discovered yet. So it left the door wide open uh, for all of that well that's nice that sounds like it's worth the dlc monies it, well and and i would and trust me you weren't the only person that said that mm-hmm. <laughs> it was a it was a major gripe of a lot of people that played the game and so um for me i am going to give it a perfect score of five out of five bottle caps <laughs> <laughs> 
Mm. I mean, there's there's so many locations in this game to explore. The main story of the game, uh, there are parts of it that are kind of weak, mm -hmm. but overall, it's it's a very compelling story. I, I will give it that. I will tip my cap to it. And once you're done with that story, there's all kinds of other things that you can do that frankly will make you forget about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, and that's not to knock it either. It's just some of these side quests are so cool. I mean, I mean, once again, I'm not, I don't want to ruin this for people that haven't played it yet. Cause there, once again, there's still people buying this game for like five bucks on steam or whatever. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there are some incredibly awesome side quests. There's, there's collectibles that frankly aren't too daunting. You've seen the bobbleheads and how they can in increase your skills and all that kind of stuff. Yep. There's a lot of things like that, that you can pick up in this game. So for me, replay value is off the charts. There you go. So much you can do here, which takes us to the last metric, which can sometimes sink or elevate a game, which is the music. Mm -hmm. And I will give a little bit of uh, an introduction to the score mm -hmm. and not score in music sense, score in, out of five, five pound caps. Again, man, just do the pun. Just do I know, it. I know, I know. <laughs> All right. So the music of Fallout is obviously heavily influenced by the alternate history that the Fallout series takes place from, okay? Mm -hmm. Which is 1950s slash 40s culture, and that's where it kind of diverts from our timeline, right? So the 50s influence, the Art Deco stuff, mm -hmm. like that is what the planet kind of went forward with, as well as like nuclear generators and all kinds of like sci-fi oriented technologies, okay? Yeah. So the music from this era is obviously rooted in real 40s and 50s music, mm -hmm. which against this backdrop, okay, adds to the creepiness, but also to that vibe of there was a society at one point. Mm -hmm. And so it's, it's like the perfect way to kind of wrap this experience around something. Not to mention the theme song to Fallout is iconic and brilliant, and it gets me pumped up even though it's <laughs> it's it's a, an orchestra, <laughs> and <laughs> and so the music for Fallout is iconic to begin with. But there's a lot of music in here that people who have no appreciation for the '50s, mm -hmm. they have started stations on YouTube just to play the music from it. Wow. Like there are people who are, like would turn on their their, their pit boy, mm -hmm. turn on the radio station, and just listen to the fifties music. So for me, I mm -hmm. I have to give this Joey five out of five bottle caps because mm -hmm. I am one of those people. I love the music so much that I will listen to it for entertainment value. <laughs> so, yeah, mm -hmm. perfect score, man. Nice. Um, I'm I'm going to go a bit lower than that. And not, not, not horribly. Like, I don't feel like I need to completely knock it. It is in the area to me where like, again, like I did throw the Pip boy radio on very often when we played. Um, so a lot of my time was just playing in game and going from place to place. And I don't think I had much of a musical accompaniment to that. Like the, the, the opening of the game was, was brilliant. The theme song was great. And the, when you do get music, it does hit the aesthetic very, very well. But to me, like, I am, I don't want to say I'm quite in, like, the Tomb Raider territory where I can say, like, I can't really place a point where the music, where the music very stands out or is memorable. Yeah. And I, I am almost there, almost there, where it's not quite as bad. But I'm going to give, because the music, like, the music that was chosen for this, like, works incredibly well. And when it's there it is very much present and does add to the experience of the game. Um, I suppose especially um, when you go into um, Vault 111 and you get to go into one of the pods, that like that music sticks out and stands out. Oh, very yes, well. yes, the Tranquility Lane, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, and that's where like that, that fit perfectly. Like this, this works, this is great. Um, but other than that... Uh, like there are points where there's just a lot of time where there is no music. Um, and I think of like some games that do that, but then suddenly when you encounter um, uh, like um, a villain or something else, like you get like a small ramp up of music 
And when the encounter's over, the music comes down to let you know that you, you can progress on, and you don't get that in this game. It's like, nope, if you didn't have music on when you went to fight it, it's not there now. And that's sure. where I think it, it also takes a bit of a hit for me. So I'm going to go with this one with four bottle caps out of five on it. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing I will say, Joe, and this is for the folks that do fact check us, because there are some out there, believe it or not, uh, that write into us about some details that we miss. Which is good. That's always appreciated. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, technically, it's Vault 112. Not ah, Vault 112. Yeah, my bad. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're very, very close, Joe. Off by one. <laughs> Yes. Well, that brings us to our final score. For those of you that know how to do math, this is anticlimactic for you. But with our final tally, we ended up giving Fallout 3 76.25%. Yeah, yeah, that's not bad. Yeah, mm -mm. yeah 30 and a half points out of a possible 40, which technically makes it a better rating than Tomb Raider, but mm -hmm. sits as the lowest game that we've scored so far oh i mean i i really do think that some of the things i said in the beginning may have seemed really harsh about fallout 3 but there's a lot of truth to it yeah you know like there are people who are critics of games just to say negative things but there are people that had legitimate gripes about this game how it was created and like mm -hmm. what the the core elements of it were and as much as i enjoyed this game like i said i've played every dlc and i've mm -hmm. And I've really enjoyed it thoroughly. Um, I hear them. I hear what those gripes are. And I agree with a lot of what they said. Because it's it's not just negativity. It's There's a lot of truth. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, though, what I think about Fallout 3 is that this is one of those rare games that may not stand the test of time for gameplay, or for graphics, I should say. Mm -hmm. But it will stand the test of time for the gameplay itself and for the things you can explore yeah. and do within it yeah I, and there's yeah I, so much i agree with half of that statement <laughs> Which yes. it's definitely like the explore game like that's going to overwhelm me but if i'm shutting down i'm not doing it just get me through the story and i'll have fun along the way but definitely gameplay um again like especially compared to video games of the day it responds very well i don't remember ever like feeling like they were dropped inputs or like oh my god it didn't shoot when i said it was supposed to um uh, it's a fun game to play and like I'm really, again, it's, I'm kind of happy to hear that there's still people out there like discovering it on steam or going out and finding it at GameStop or re or local video game resale and picking it up for the first time, because I would definitely recommend that. Um, especially if like, if you're maybe you haven't played any follow title and you're looking to get into what the games are like, and you can find this like, you know, for what, five, 10 bucks at, at a resale shop, like take mm -hmm. a chance on that. Like it's, it's worth the five or ten dollars, despite it being, you know, an older, a significantly older game at this point. So yeah. definitely, definitely worth your time if you haven't picked this game up. Totally, and, and I, I agree with you. I really do. Uh, for people that are brand new to this, that are just picking it up for the first time, mm -hmm. I truly think if you live within the era that this game came out and not tested against current graphics and current gen you seriously will love it. And there's a lot of people, if you just go to social media, if you check out Twitter, they're still discovering mm -hmm. it for the first time yeah. and really loving it. So um, so with that, I really do think um, this is a great game. It's a mm -hmm. wonderful experience, but there are some very clear problems that exist within it. And so I guess you can tell us whether or not you agree, and I'm sure mm -hmm. some will. <laughs> but, <laughs> but hey, with that, we do thank you for listening to Digital Dissection. And as always... We appreciate all that the Dissection crew does for us week after week. Mm -hmm. We're actually seeing like record download numbers for us, and it's not just an exaggeration. We're talking our best weeks have happened multiple weeks yeah. <laughs> consistently. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it is absolutely incredible. But hey, you know what? If you happen upon this show by accident, mm -hmm. why not drop us a review or comment on the show? We also love to hear from you. So email us over at Digital Dissection Podcast at gmail.com and once again the reviews help us a ton to help us get discovered so any feedback you have for us we welcome it we like people we do <laughs> we like people and we like to hear what they have to say and sometimes even if it's like maybe you just email us about your weekend and maybe you could tell us a great place to find a really good sandwich or something in our, in our local areas we'd appreciate that too so until next time keep on dissecting